Well, first of all, I graduated from Texas A&M University and was in the Corps of Cadets there and was commissioned as a second lieutenant upon graduation in uh, 1972. And then I went into the military and uh, first thing, of course, is the infantry officer basic course because I chose to be an infantry officer and uh, then ranger school and, and one of the things that was unique in the fact that I had actually volunteered to be considered to go to Vietnam, which we were pulling out at the time. And uh, when we were in our infantry officer basic course, that one day we were in the uh, theater type setting and there was a captain that was lecturing and uh, all of a sudden Lieutenant Colonel came in and just stopped him and says, how many people in the room have been told that you'll go to whatever schools that you're, you're scheduled for and then possibly go to Vietnam? And there were probably about 20-25% of us that raised our hand. So well, the President had a news conference this morning and announced that he's doubling the rate of the pullout and all of you will be sent somewhere else, and, uh, and, but not to Vietnam. And so the, the interesting part is, is, of course, all of the choice spots were all taken by guys who selected, here's where I want to go. And uh, that meant the, the rest of us uh, didn't get the choicest of spots. Uh, I went to Fort Hood, Texas and uh, was in the 2nd Armored Division. And I thought uh, I had a three-year obligation and I thought, well, I'll serve my time at Fort Hood. And, and uh, then figure what I'm going to do with my life afterwards. And in fact, after a couple of years, I began to look at some things, uh, including a master's degree. And I had actually gone back to A&M, talked to them, and had uh, had uh, done the preliminary work to uh, to uh, apply and apply for some uh, grants and scholarships. And one day I got a phone call from who my first battalion commander was, uh, who now is at the Pentagon, and said, uh, would you like to serve in the Ranger Battalion? And I said, boy, would I. And he says, well, uh, that uh, is, is an opening that is coming up, and I can put your name in. Uh, what, uh, what, when they formed the 1st Battalion uh, Rangers, they wanted all of the senior NCOs and all of the officers to be co uh, combat. Uh, officers are, are with CIB and uh, uh, that was nice but that meant all of the uh, lieutenants were all senior and they were all of those were being promoted and they were going to leave some slots and and uh, they needed to fill those and as a result I uh, said absolutely forgot about getting a master's degree went to uh, Fort Stewart Georgia and joined the 1st Battalion Rangers and uh, served with them when I was promoted to captain. Uh, I had actually was enjoying what I was doing and considering maybe a career. Uh, there weren't slots for a captain at, the, at that time and the question is what will you do? And I had the two choices. I could be the assistant to the assistant uh, S3 in a battalion and or I could be on division staff and, and be an assistant G3. Uh, and I chose to be on the division staff because I felt I would be doing more and, and a, a better situation than just being in a, a fill-in slot uh, or a slot that was made just to hold somebody. And uh, so I served there uh, and it, somewhere along the line uh, about, about a year in, uh, I, uh, I felt like, well, I will have a few commands in my military career. Uh, but most of it will be on staff. And I had a whole lot more fun with the troops than I had on staff and made the decision that that was not what I wanted to do. And so I began the process of, okay, what will I do uh, when I get out and began to get things together to, to, uh, to leave the Army. Uh, when I left, I thought, well, that's it. Um, uh, that military career is behind me. That's a phase of my life I won't revisit, and we will move on down the road. Uh, what I did not realize is that you, know, you become involved in the American Legion, and all of a sudden the fact that you were in the military was still a big deal. And, uh, and then when I became national commander, uh, trying to think of the themes that we would use, well, being a ranger was, was something unique and it became a theme and so all of that was something that was, was brought back up. And so the fact that that phase of my life really never went to the rear, uh, it's always been there and influenced everything that's, uh, that's come after. My dad is a veteran, and uh, while he was a member of the DAV, and I believe he was a member of the VFW, I'm not absolutely even positive, I, I, I really was not familiar with the American Legion. 
And uh, so when I got out of the military, the first uh, couple, three years uh, was, was uh, in a different community than, than Brenham here. And uh, so I was out trying to build a business and whatever, and the opportunity came to, to come here. And uh, when I moved here, literally within the first week I was here, I moved here March 1st, 1980. Uh, the first week, uh, one of the people that I was dealing with and, and, and became a client uh, said, well, you were in the military, weren't you? Uh, yes. Uh, how would you like to join the American Legion? And I said, what's the American Legion? He said, well, I'll tell you what, the American Legion birthday party is coming up and we've got the department commander coming in and we're going to have a dinner. There'll be a couple hundred people there. Why don't you and your wife come as our guest and, and you can see. So we went down to the Legion and uh, were uh, at the dinner. and. Um, uh, what was interesting is, is the department commander after dinner uh, got up to speak and being like so many department commanders, he got up and says, well, the number one issue is membership and we're behind right now and we need to work harder at membership and what can you do? And the guy who had invited us jumped to his feet, waved his hand, said, commander. And a commander looked over at him and said, yes, sir. He says, well, I've got a young veteran here that just moved to the community and he wants to join. And he turned to me and says, don't you? <laughs> and so I had 200 people staring at me and what do you think the answer was going to be? And so anyway, yeah, okay. And so I, w I became the newest member of the American Legion. The only difference was I shocked everybody because I went to the next post meeting. I had someone say, I bet when you joined, you say, someday I'm going to be uh, national commander. I, I, sitting there that night when I was asked, I thought, man, if I work hard and I really learn and I really, someday I might be the post commander. You know, that's what I could see. And that's where, and, and, but as you move up, you, you know, you learn more and, and you're kind of at a higher level. When I became post adjutant, of course, I get all the correspondence from the department level. And upcoming is a, uh, is, is a uh, department executive committee. So I'm looking and of course not knowing how it operates, you're looking saying, okay, it is Thursday through Sunday. Okay. Did not understand Thursday and Friday are committee meetings that then report to the executive committee when they're meeting. And most people don't go to the committee meetings unless you're on the committee. And so, um, you know, I had no clue. So I make the hotel reservations. I go to Austin. I'm there on Thursday and I go to every single committee meeting, sitting there, listening to what's going on and learning from what's going on. And what I found interesting is, is then when it goes to uh, that these committee chairmen are reporting to the department executive committee, there's questions and, and what all, because they didn't go to the committee meeting. They don't know all the discussion that went into the answer or, or the solution or the, the, or the recommendation that's being brought before them. And so they're re-asking and they're hashing things back and forth. And I'm sitting out in, in, the, uh, in the audience and, and I kind of at one point said, it shook my head and said, you know, don't they understand? Ta -da, 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 da That's what was discussed. And the guy I'm sitting look, next to looked at me like, oh, really? And then as it came out, here's what was discussed. So how'd you know that? Well, I showed up at the committee meeting. I was there and, and I, I, while I wasn't talking, I was part of the discussion. I listened to everything that was going on and learned. And so I went to the midwinter conference. I went to, you know, department convention, et cetera. I started showing up for things. And what I found interesting was, you know, fast forward a year or so and I'm sitting out in the audience and I had people asking me about things that's going on because I had done my homework. I had showed up. I had been part of the discussions. And they're looking to me for answers. You've been in the Legion 30 years. I've been in the, in the Legion a year and a half or two. You know, why are you looking to me? Well, the bottom line is they never went past being a one-year Legionnaire. Uh, in fact, the, the funny story there is the fact that when I was national commander, you, you, you got to be polite to people, but occasionally, you know, you got that, that, that person that's very difficult to be polite to. I won't say the department, I won't embarrass somebody, but we were touring a department and that evening we were going to be speaking to a whole district group or whatever, or a surrounding group that were coming in for a dinner at this post. We arrived way early. I mean, we're going to have dinner at 6.30, 7 o'clock, and we're there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And so I said, well, let's 
go by the post, let you see the lay of the land. You'll see kind of what's going to happen. Then you can go back and rest at the hotel for a minute before you, you know, change clothes and, and come back for the evening activity. And so we're looking around and decided to go through the club room and say hi to who the, the ones that are there and we're going along. So I just am working my way down and just talking to people, introducing myself and what all. And I got to the very last guy. And of course, he's sitting there at the bar with a drink in front of him. And uh, he said, uh, I got a question. So how long have you been a legionnaire? Well, at the time I was national commander, um, you know, it had been like 23 years or something of that sort. And so, you know, I, I said 23 uh, years. And, uh, and he says, well, I've been a legionnaire for 35. I guess that qualifies me to be national commander more than you. And so you're sitting there saying you don't want to say anything negative and you're looking around and the post commander's just embarrassed as he can be. The department commander's like, go ahead, just go ahead, you know. And so I looked at him and I says, no, sir, you're not better qualified to be national commander than me. See, the difference is I've had 23 years of experience. You've had one year of experience 23 times. And that was it. He didn't say a word, <laughs> but that's what happens out there is folks don't know anything more than this and they don't care to be more involved and they don't care to be, to learn any more than that. And that's the difference. On a national level, one of the things that was interesting is um, uh, we hosted in Texas the uh, San Antonio Convention. And, and I say the, actually it was two of them, but the first one. I was a district vice commander and uh, fixing to become a district commander. And um, uh, I volunteered to be one of the drivers that um, goes to the airport, picks up people, brings them back. I know a lot, of, a lot of that's contract today, but used to, that was our responsibility. Somebody said, well, we got this red-eye flight coming in from Chicago and past national commander John Geiger is on that flight and you're to pick him up and says, do you know who it is? No clue, know nothing about him whatsoever. And so uh, at that time, there wasn't all the security things. You could go right up to the gate. And I had a piece of cardboard and I, or poster board and wrote John Geiger on it. And so I'm up there and I'm standing there holding the, the thing up. There were some other uh, Illinois Legionnaires on that plane. And as they would get off, they'd say, well, he's talking to somebody up there. He'll be off in a minute. And what also, I'm standing there, I'm standing there. Well, he finally comes and we greet each other. I take him down to baggage, get his baggage, get in the car. And we are now in morning rush hour. <laughs> and so it means the, the, the trip was twice as, or maybe even three times as long as normal when it's not in rush hour. And so we had a lot of t a chance just to visit. And so uh, we talked a lot, he talked a lot about what was my background and you know, what, what am I doing and what was my plans as district commander. And I've talked about what strengths and weaknesses of my district and some of the goals I had set and, and how we were gonna try to achieve those goals and, and some of that. Well, when uh, time for appointments came uh, on national committees uh, in October, um, m he made sure my name was in the hopper and I got a national appointment and a call in to go to Washington, D.C. And, and set on National Security Commission. And, uh, and so, you know, you show up, you're involved, and, and, and people pay attention. It's, wow, okay. And so, you know, you have the opportunity to do something else as a result. And then your department commander later, and, and people look and say, wow, look at what he did. And so my Legion career was something that just kind of unfolded. Uh, it wasn't something that was, here's the goal or here's what we do. It's just something that unfolded. Uh, and uh, it, as a result, uh, you know, it's just one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And then one day, it's like, wow, would you like to be national commander? Well, we had a, a number of things that were significant. And, and, and you also have to understand what I concentrated on coming from the legislative background. Uh, I concentrated on legislative and uh, in fact I spent as many or more days in Washington DC than I spent in Indianapolis which is very unusual for a commander and uh, you know there there was a lot of positive for that concurrent receipt was important to me that we pass it and overall all veterans organizations were making a push for it 
and, and trying to have people talk back home and whatever. And so as I'm coming in as commander, uh, it's out there, it's being talked about. But the hard part was the Congress is looking, saying, whoa, how much is it going to cost us? I'm not sure we want to do it. The bill that was coming forward was going to redefine disability. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let them draw full military retirement and disability, but only in these cases. And there's a whole lot of people that were getting out of the military with disability that would no longer qualify under the bill that was, that was coming forward. And so one of the things that, that we had done is, of course, as commander, you come in a couple weeks after you're elected, you have the testimony, you meet the Speaker of the House, you meet the Senate Majority Leader. And, and to me, one of the key cogs that I was trying to do was meet the House Majority Leader, Tom DeLay, because nobody ever talked with him. You can't, in fact, it's next to impossible to get in to see him, you know. But I, it was important. Well, him being from Texas and I pulled strings with other Texas people that I knew. If you remember, the governor of Texas nominated me for national commander. You know, we, I used all my political clout to make sure that I got an appointment with Tom DeLay to be able to discuss that. Uh, and and uh, I know that, that um, uh, when I was doing the testimony, one of the things that happened is, is uh, one of the congressmen says, well, you don't understand how this stuff works. You know, there's a congressman from Texas that has all this bottled up, and unless he clears it, it's not going to happen. And I responded to him. I said, yes, sir, I know. That's why I have an appointment at 6 o'clock with him this evening. And everybody just, he doesn't see people. How in the world did you get that? Of course, I didn't tell all the stories of all that I had to do. I also didn't tell them that I went to high school with him, but, you know, minor details there. But uh, uh, we got in to see him. And so when we go in and we're sitting down uh, and, and, and talking with him, um, he said, well, the problem with disability is it's too easy. He says, you can have this guy out there that, that did whatever in the military, and he goes back and he's working in a tire shop, and a tire does whatever, and it breaks his arm or, or leg, and he, he files for VA disability. And I looked at him and I says, I don't know who in the hell you've been talking to, but we got people with legitimate stuff that doesn't, don't have the, the documentation and, 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 and they don't get it. And, and so we've got deserving people that can't get it. Somebody who doesn't deserve is not getting it. Who are you talking to? So what happened is, is we deflected the movement that was going on to redefine disability. And what we ended up with is that only those 50% or more would be able to draw it. And it would be phased in over a 10-year period because there would be a cost to it. And, and so uh, I, I told folks, I said, we're going to get a half a loaf, you know. But nowhere had there ever been a bill passed that they recognized a person could draw military retirement and disability without having to give up portion of one or the other uh, or have it offset and all. So when that bill moved, and, and, and actually passed, uh, you know, there was people, look at what we did, look, once again, you know, they may have uh, had initial pressure, they may have done initial testimony, but when it came down to what was going to happen, you know, it, it was right there in that room uh, that night. In fact, uh, the House Chairman at, at that point of the Veterans Affairs Committee was Chris Smith from New Jersey. And a few years later, Chris and I were, were sitting and talking with each other. And I told him that story, and he says, that's interesting because he says, I knew we were going this way, and literally I got a call in the morning, and we started going this way, and I never knew what happened. But we were able to be in the right place with the right person to make something happen, major happen, that nobody thought could happen or was hoping that it could, but not really sure we could pull it off. And look what happened. And it was because we were there with the connections that we had, with the groundwork that we had laid to be able to make it happen. And to me, that was probably the most significant thing that happened when I was national commander, even though I can name some other things. That was huge. And there's all kinds of folks that jump up and take credit for it. But there were three people in the room that evening, Steve Robertson, myself, and Tom DeLay. They weren't there. I was unique in the fact that, that the World War II Memorial was dedicated to Memorial Day my year.
And, and, and so not only did I get to attend that, but, but uh, the Legion hosted a breakfast that morning for all the major players before we went to the ceremony. And so that was just really just a super thing. And then literally I went from Washington straight over to Europe and it was the 60th anniversary of D-Day celebration that was going on in Europe. And, and, and we were there for that with the, uh, President Bush and President uh, Chirac from, from France that were part of the ceremonies and whatever. So those were unique because while there's always an anniversary, there's always a Memorial Day, uh, that was not uh, something that happened in most years. Well, I, I think culture is, is different today. I think because the culture is different, the, the newer generations are different. They react different. We've got to change the way we do things because that's what they expect. And if we're not meeting that need, then we are not going to have them involved. And I know that, that the other day somebody said, yeah, but they're not joiners. Well, I heard that about Vietnam veterans. You know, Vietnam veterans are not joiners, and yet today, who's the largest block of veterans in the American Legion? Vietnam veterans, okay? Because as their kids are raised and they get to a different point in their life, and, the, and some of those old things are beginning to now become chronic problems, and they need to go to the VA, and you know, who is it can help me, and, and whatever. All of that's changing. Well, that's happening here too, but how do we get them involved in the earlier times and whatever? We need to be involved in a different way, and we've not done a good job of that, and that's what we need to do. The good job is to reach out and touch in the ways that they're used to being touched. Uh, I know that uh, the other day somebody said something about something on Facebook. I don't do Facebook. You know, that, I'm too busy to mess around with that stuff. But guess what? The younger generation does, and that's how they live their life. And if I'm going to touch them, I'm going to have to do that. Or I'm going to have to have people who know how to do it that's doing it. Because if we don't, we're left behind. And we are leaving them out. And we're not touching them in the ways that they're wanting to be touched. And, 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 and then we become this old man's organization or old woman's organization that doesn't relate to the young people. And we have to relate to the young people. Too often somebody joins and says, I want to be department commander, I want to be national commander. You know, that's not it. You've got to be good at the, at the, at the grassroots. You've got to be good in the program. You've got to be knowledgeable in the, in the programs uh, in order to be able to, 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 be, to the, be the leader that knows what the organization is about and can deal with the issues of the organization that will come up. And, and so often, uh, you know, you'll see somebody that because of... Uh, uh, let's say they, they're an attorney and they become judge advocate, and boy, they were looking for judge advocate, but after a few years saying, I want to be department commander. They've never been a post commander. They've never been a district commander. They don't comprehend. And normally, and there's exceptions, but normally they're not a great commander. While they'll bring certain leadership, leadership skills and things to the table, there's a base of knowledge about things that they don't have. And as a result, they don't handle that well. And, and so you've got to have this base of knowledge and that base of knowledge comes from experiencing the differing things and being involved in them and not only that, not superficially, but actually read the book or read the resolutions or, or, or whatever and you know that's a, that's a big deal and, and unfortunately there's a whole lot of folks that just don't want to mess with that. Well, they're not the leaders we're looking for. We're, we're looking for folks that want to immerse themselves and be at that, at that level of involvement because those are the ones that will understand and move us forward in ways that we need to, to do and make good decisions based on what needs to be made. If I, if I didn't feel like I was doing something important, if I didn't feel like I'm helping these things happen, I don't know that I would necessarily do that, but I really do think that I'm helping do some things that might not get done if I wasn't involved or somebody has to be and, and I'm, I'm there and so you know I want to be. Uh, I know that um, earlier we talked or, or, or kind of hinted at the fact of you know where does the Legion go from here. Uh, I know that I had someone one day make a comment says, well, as the World War II generation dies away and whatever, this is a dying organization. Well, no, it's not. Uh, we need people involved and we need people going. But I don't devote this kind of effort and this much time and, and whatever 
for a dying organization. I, I'm devoting this effort because it's, a, it's an organization that's done so much good and can continue to do so much good. But we need people involved in, in fact, doing these things. And I believe that people want to be involved with the organization doing good. We just have to, to tell them what we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're the premier organization getting things done. I've, I've alluded to that with a few things that we've done. Other folks taking credit for what we've done. But the bottom line on it is we are a great organization and we find something and we grab it and we make it work and, and we make a difference. Does that mean the others don't? No, I'm not saying that. But I think if you take a look at the overall effort and the overall accomplishments, we are the premier veterans organization in America. There is no doubt about that.